So there's this sort of like crude social Darwinist idea of evolution that because in nature there's the survival of the fittest species, sometimes people will say, well, in human relations, the survival of the fittest individuals pushes human evolution forward. Human life is a competition between all human beings to reproduce more and the people who are most fit to evolve do so at the expense of others and that you pass down sort of like your specific bloodline and even in some of the most ridiculous versions of this you pass on your specific political beliefs this oh no conservatives are having more babies than liberals like liberalism is going to die out like it's a it's a weirdly common thing to hear people say right, right, but right. in human evolution we didn't evolve and get this far we didn't build bridges and go to space and create libraries and create taxonomy for all all other species and mourn the loss of biodiversity and so on because we were so busy competing with each other to reproduce. The real reason that human beings have been able to become the most influential species on the biosphere and one of the most populous and complex species that has done a lot of incredible things is actually not through competition with one another, but through the opposite, mutual aid, working together. And specifically, honestly, the power of friendship. The power of friendship is what brought humanity through the darkest times in human history, the toughest times, the times that we were closest to being wiped out as a species. What brought us through there was human beings supporting one another, befriending one another, even from, you know, different sort of like tribal groups, like our capacity to build friendships with each other is one of the roots of our evolutionary success. Yeah, if you're talking about evolutionary fitness, ability to survive and go on for as long as possible, like long enough to reach reproductive age, long enough to have successful future generations raise them, etc. The stuff that makes that more possible isn't how strong one person is or how fit one person is, how great one person is at building shelter for them and their family. The thing that really really raises evolutionary fitness. The thing that gives us such an edge is, well, a lot of things, obviously, our intelligence, opposable thumbs, ability to make tools, all this kind of stuff. But all of that stuff only gets you so far by yourself as an individual. But with the power of friendship, with the power of social ties with people that you trust, care about, who you have their back and they have your back, that kind of stuff acts as such an amplifier for all these other great abilities we have and makes it so that it's actually possible to utilize those abilities to the highest degree possible. Because like you need other people's help sometimes to do most things. Like there's very few things, uh, especially in like a state of nature out in the wild, but like there's just very few things you can do all by yourself that are sustainable or will last for very long. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like most everything that human beings have ever accomplished in history that was awesome was a result of people working together or more than one person. Like there's a sort of mythological idea of sort of like the lone genius or something like that, or like the great man theory of history. Maybe a more accurate way of looking at it would be that genius is something that happens in groups. Maybe the great group theory of history would be more accurate. But even something like you could say, okay, uh, Isaac Newton has invented this incredible new way of seeing the world, physics. What makes an individual's admittedly really genius contribution to science or discourse or philosophy or whatever, so important to the development and movement of the human species is the collaborative process that happens after that. That is other people reviewing it, giving feedback, developing it passing it on. We are a group species and we have evolved to be a group species. And if we had evolved to be an individualistic species, I think we'd look really, really different. Yeah, actually, Oxford psychologist Robin Dunbar, people have probably heard of the phrase Dunbar's number before. It's like, oh, you can have like a little bit over 100 strong social connections. Like we have about that many slots in our head to be like, this is my group. This is my people. Robin Dunmar, their work in evolutionary science actually suggests that the neural power that's necessary to 
keep track of those complex relationships, the fact that we can have over a hundred complex relationships with people and like how much brain power that takes is why we have such large brains compared to other mammals. And they also found that one of the best ways to predict the size of a primate's brain without actually measuring it is to look at the size of the primate's social group. So this theory that the size of our social group and the fact of our heightened ability to make friends, being responsible for brain size, is something that you can generalize across other primate species, our closest evolutionary cousins. So the place that we come from in human prehistory, the evolutionary trajectory that human beings are on, has been defined in a large part literally by the power of friendship, literally by our capacity to easily make friends, even with strangers, for the purposes of mutual aid and community stability. The power of friendship, the ability to make friends, is as human, as fundamentally human, as part of human nature, as walking upright on two legs and having opposable thumbs. It's as fundamentally human as possessing the powers of speech and complex, abstract reasoning. Part of what makes us human is our friendships. But also there's kind of friendships between other species. And like they have social relationships or they have mutually beneficial relationships. It's not quite the same thing as a human friendship. You have symbiotic relationships and within that there's three categories. Mutualism where both parties benefit. Commensalism where only one species benefits but the other's unharmed. Or parasitism where one gains at the other's expense. And you could sort of argue that mutualism and commensalism are like friendships. You know, like there's that African bird that like goes in crocodile's mouths and like eat the food from between its teeth. And the crocodile doesn't eat the bird because they get a benefit. So they have like a complementary relationship. And you also sort of have like proto friendships in primate species or intelligent mammal species like dolphins. You could argue that the sort of automation of the anthill is a type of friendship where they've all got these complementary roles in relation to each other. Right, right, right. And they're all like friends of the queen. Well, I think one of the like crucial things that makes human friendship unique and different is we have a concept of friendship and we think about what it means to be a good friend and what is a bad friend and we can update what we're doing based on our ideas and have this sort of relationship between our complex reasoning abilities and our social relationships that can kind of like ideally help us to do them better. Yeah. And I mean, we're definitely on the same sort of continuum of consciousness, recognizing and appreciating the other in a mutual yeah, sense. Yeah, it didn't spring out of no, like all species before us had no mutualistic, really, yeah. But that's completely consistent with our sort of idea of like how evolution works and where human beings come from in the universe. It's like we're on a continuum with, with less complex vertebrates, less complex mammals. Yeah. So it makes sense that they would have sort of proto-friendships, but also that just because of some of the unique features of our species, and like you mentioned, complex thought and language, like we have much more complex and self-aware friendships. And part of our evolution in particular has been guided by these friendships. Part of the reason that we are the species that we are today is a record that goes back thousands and thousands of years of developing higher and higher capacity for complex friendships. So like, while well, you might have like, say, two pandas who tend to eat eucalyptus together, and they might have a... Yeah, like they benefit each other in some way. Even if it's just the benefit of like having a sort of like calming neurotransmitter released through the familiarity of having closeness of another the way that we do it is just like fucking crazy compared to them like you make friends with people based on music that you listen to or media that you consume or like the workplace that you're in and like these are all unique human relationships that are part of like a fundamentally different way of interacting with the world which humans just interact with the world in a fundamentally different way than any other species that we know of on earth and you can find continuities between us and them, and we absolutely should. We shouldn't be like crudely anthrocentric and be like, oh, humans are so great. We beat everyone, rah, rah. But at the same time, you, you got to acknowledge that there is like a, there's a threshold that's passed where you're just like on a certain other different level. 
So I think the degree and type of friendships we have are absolutely unique. Yeah, definitely. Early, you said our friendships are what make us human, but in a way, the things that make us human are what make our friendships so exceptional. Yeah, and it's interesting to think maybe the things that make us human co-developed alongside our capacity for friendships. So like yeah. when it comes to stuff like the development of like music, technology, complex thought and language, we could sort of think of them as being potentially outgrowths of the proto-human's preoccupation with the social as an evolutionary strategy, which was really effective. And that isn't Care Bear stuff. That's hard science. In fact, you can think of Care Bears as a sort of scientific documentary. Yeah, it's a bit metaphorical. Obviously, the stomachs don't light up and shoot things out. But if you think about the deeper meaning, it's definitely scientific. The universe is absolutely full of friendship at every level in nature. Starting at the smallest, we find friendship. Endosymbiosis theory says that eukaryotic cells, like the ones that make up our body, are a result of a union between prokaryotic cells. So every cell in our body is a group of friends. Every cell in our body is held together by friendship. The bodies of human beings and rabbits and dogs, plants, they're made up of many eukaryotic cells, which work together to make a more complex living organism. They're big groups of friends. For every one human cell in your body, there are 10 microorganisms, which play a vital role in human health. These complementary microorganisms make up one to 3% of your body mass. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you have about five pounds of bacteria friends in your stomach, nose, intestines, and mouth. Now that's friendship. 80 to 90% of plant species have symbiotic relationships with fungi. Most plants have fungal friends that use their mycelial networks to channel water and minerals from the soil up to the plants. And in exchange, the plants provide the products of photosynthesis to fuel the metabolism of the fungus. The plants and fungal growth have a mutualistic relationship where they, as two cute friends, lift spoons up to each other's mouths and feed one another in a way they couldn't do alone. There is a bird called the Egyptian plover, which routinely flies into the mouths of crocodiles. But crocodiles don't eat them because they're friends. The plover eats pieces of food out of the crocodile's teeth, getting a meal, and the crocodile benefits by having clean teeth and looking fabulous. The honey guide bird of Southern Africa is a great friend to the Hazda people, a local indigenous group. The bird leads humans to beehives, changing its call to let them know when they're close. Then the Hazda people use fire to smoke the bees out of the hive, allowing them to collect honey. And while they do that, the honey guide bird takes their share. Honey bees and flowers also have mutualistic relationships. The bee moves pollen from flower to flower, helping them reproduce, and the bees take pollen to the hive to produce honey. Bees and flowers are friends, and without that friendship, the thriving of both would be stifled. Under the sea, clownfish and sea anemones have a mutualistic relationship. The clownfish lives in the sea anemone, eating from the scraps of the things the anemone kills and getting protection from it. And in exchange, it keeps away parasites. That's a cute, nice little friendship. We find friendships in nature, in every subcategory of species, friendships within species as well as friendships across species. Friendship is part of human nature. It's part of the nature of consciousness itself. It's part of the nature of life in the universe. And if we ever go to the stars, our destiny is to make friends out there. The universe is absolutely full of friendship. <laughs>